today we're going to talk about a subject that's interesting to everybody in the chess world, I hope. And that is the question of Nakamura, who lives in St. Louis, Hikaru Nakamura, and has been as high as number three in the world. Um, a lot of burning questions to people in the United States is, will Nakamura ever become a potential world champion? Will he ever play that world championship match? Probably against Magnus Carlsen and fight to become number one in the whole world. Um, Nakamura seemed to have a lot of troubles against Carlsen in the past. His score is just wretched. He hasn't won a single game except Blitzer Rapid. So um, he came very close recently, and that's one of the games that we're going to talk about today. Um, he also did decently against Magnus in his, their outing here at the Sinkfield Cup. And he credited that partly to his uh, new style choice here. He actually wore sunglasses during the game. Apparently, he was a little psyched out by his um, arch nemesis, uh, number one in the world by a large margin. And he wore sunglasses to the game. And he drew both games, um, drawing comfortably with the black pieces, which was particularly impressive. I'm actually here in St. Louis um, also partly to play poker, which I'm going to start as soon as I'm done my residency <laughs> stint. So I thought this was kind of an appropriate send off to uh, show this picture. I was doing commentary for the, that event, actually. And um, we <laughs> wore sunglasses to that game as well. So Who's the chick? <laughs> that's me, just dressed up a little bit. So, and also, not just in over the board have the have you know Carlson and Nakamura kind of gone off. Also in interviews, which I find pretty interesting. You know, a lot of the top players when they're asked about. You know their main competitors. They're they're really professional about it. They say, "I have utmost respect for my opponent. I think they're awesome. You know, um, they could beat me on any given day. I'm going to try to win." That you see like a lot of things like that. People being very respectful and nice. Whereas between uh, Carlson and Nakamura, it's not exactly the same. Um, in fact, uh, uh, Nakamura referred to Carlson as the Sauron of chess. <laughs> and said that he is going to have to take him down one of these days. Um, I, I actually haven't seen Lord of the Rings myself, so I'm sorry if I butchered that pronunciation. But I was trying to channel another um, very uh, frequent grandmaster in residence here at the club, Yasser Sarawan, which I think it would, I should have just said that. That would have been closer, right? <laughs> um, so anyway, Magnus's response to this uh, thing by uh, Nakamura, the statement to Nakamura on his uh, Reddit MA, AMA, Ask Me Anything, was I might be more uh, disturbed by this comment if I ever saw Lord of the Rings or if Nakamura was a stronger player. <laughs> so, that was pretty awesome. <laughs> anyway, let's take a look. And of course, those of you might know that Nakamura has one of the most uncompromising styles in the world. So he kind of goes up and down a lot. I said he was number three in the world quite recently, I think just a few months ago. He's already dipped, as you can see on this live chess rating list, he's already dipped to number eight. Uh, which is unfortunate. We really like to see him up there and in the top spots. I, for one, um, am a big Carlson fan, big Aronian fan. I like a lot of these guys, but I just think it'd be really good for chess in America if Nakamura were to be in like those top few spots. So anyway, here is his biggest chance where he came extremely close to doing what he had never done before. And we'll take a look at this game um, pretty quickly because I also want to show you one other Nakamura highlight. So. Nakamura wearing sunglasses in that game. I don't think he wore them in this game, but he's known in general to be a very um, double-edged player. So you'll see one characteristic in this game that you see when players um, want to play fighting chess. You can't always force it, but what Nakamura did here was he managed to play a line that would result in a queenside castling. And generally, when you castle on the queen side, the game becomes very double-edged, right? Um, and he started with this line f3. So he's kind of already signifying that he's going to play like a more sharp line against the Nimzo Indian here. Uh, ben Feingold in the audience, uh, you, what, you used to play queen c2 normally on move 4, right? So you, yeah, so Grandmaster Feingold in the audience, a big fan of the move queen c2. Yay. And usually not following it up with queenside castling. <laughs> <laughs> That's pretty rare, exactly. I mean, honestly, you don't see queenside castling a lot in d4 openings for logical reasons. I know we're of all different levels. I think we've got 
um, players all the way up from uh, all the way from grandmaster to I don't know. Um, I'll be generous and say 1600. <laughs> there we go. Anyone who's under that's just instantly been upgraded to 1600. <laughs> We've got a couple of um, poker players in the audience too, and one of them's an expert. So there you go. Um, we got F3. So after D5, we ha we see this line where Magnus now can take on C3, but instead he decided to retreat the bishop with E7. So bishop takes C3 being slightly more common. And Nakamura grabbing the big center with e4. That's usually like e, the battle for e4 is usually the whole thing about the Nimzo. So f3, of course, is a bit of a weakening move, but it does immediately grab the e4 square. And now, for those of you who don't know the theory, any guesses in what black plays here? If you know the theory, you know you know the theory. But e5, e5, yes. E5 is the move that was played here. It's a good move. The idea is that white's just not going to get a lot if he takes his pawn after the queen trade in knight g4. It's um, going to be uh, very fine for if you you know if, if we take this queen off and you take with a knight, this hangs. And if you take with a king, we see that knight g4 is hitting on this and hitting on that, and it's uh, definitely adequate for black. Not winning for black, but adequate. So instead, uh, Nakamura, of course, played d5. And now this is kind of the idea that when you play the pawn on e5, you can get some control over the dark squares. So bishop c5. And for what it's worth, this game's really long, so I'm going to go through some of it a little bit quicker. Otherwise, we'll never get to uh, Nakamura's win, which uh, would be such a bad beat for him if we only show his terrible <laughs> loss. <laughs> Might happen. We'll have to see. I may have to like whiz through the Anon game. Um, so after castles, knight f3, bishop g4. We see now that white is preparing to castle queenside, right? And we don't see this a lot in d4 openings because the king is a lot airier here with all these squares. But in this particular position, it's not, white also has a lot of control, so it's not going to be that easy to kind of break through and punish us for that. And meanwhile, we're really ready um, and well set up to start an attack of our own. So Nakamura felt like it was well worth it to have his king exposed like this in order to uh, make the game more exciting and perhaps score his, his first victory against his nemesis. So now knight e2 attacking this. Carlson played c5. And now, uh, what move do you think uh, Nakamura played here? What's that? You think he played here? <coughs> no, he did not play that. Let's see. Why didn't he play that right away? I think. Well, yeah, that's for sure. <laughs> I mean, but um, I'm looking like for the tactical. It looks like it looks like like, what, like black's going to get like quite a lot of play here. Much more than in the game. I mean, there should be like a decent amount of compensation. B6. Well, yeah, queen b6 and knight e5 is coming. Yeah. So Carlson wanted to kind of keep more control in the position instead, because he really does have a lot of control. With a pawn on d5, it really um, prohibits black from. Doing much. <clears throat> so instead, White decided to kind of get going with his attack. So it, he could have played h4, but instead of h4, he played g4, yeah. So he's going to try to play both moves, like g4 and h4. And now. Carlson played a5. So he's trying to kind of get a grip on things here, perhaps play a4 at some moment, and g get some of the major pieces in. Now what do you think uh, Nakamura played? He didn't take on f6. He kind of wants to take on f6 if he has a really good reason. But generally, um, he, wa he wanted to maybe wait for the right moment, because keeping this bishop would be kind of cool. Getting an attack and keeping the bishop alive, just because it's a it's a great attacking piece. Bishops generally are. 
Usually when you castle queenside, at some point there's a key move you like to make. Yes, exactly. King B1. They also call this sometimes the grandmaster move because grandmasters play it at all sorts of like strange times that um, might seem weird because there's all, all sorts of exciting things going on in this position. And they take a timeout to play King B1. But really, it, it's safer on B1. And there's a lot of reasons why Nakamura is going to find it useful to have this king here, including one that's a little bit more unusual, which we'll see in a minute. Now, besides king b1 and h4, what are some other things that white probably wants to do in this position? What do you think he wants to do with this knight? Do you think he wants to take this bishop off on d4, or do you think he has other plans for this knight? Yeah, yeah well, this looks like a very strong square for the knight, right? Knight to f5. Because on that square, it'll really coordinate well with this bishop to create an attack on this king. So king b1, and now after rook to a6, knight g3 was played, trying to get that brutal knight f5 move in. And notice that if black had ever played h6 in this position, this knight f5 move would be even stronger. So that's another example of how you always want to like think about it when you play a move like h6. Now I'm, now I'm really harping on Arjun, sorry, <laughs> and his move h6 earlier. But it's definitely still a possibility in some variations because it's forcing. But you really got to make sure that you're gaining enough um, for the weaknesses that you're creating. So here instead, <coughs> We saw g6 to try to just like stop knight to f5 since it's such a strong square. And now uh, what do you expect, what do you expect uh, Nakamura, well I already showed you, so why do you think Nakamura played h4? To rip the g5. Just to continue with the attack, right? Now a4. Now what? Nakamura has a lot of good continuations in this game, but... Um, h5 is one possibility. He could also kind of try to increase his tack. In the game, he actually played rook to h2. Another possibility is to play bishop to h6. So he's got a lot of interesting attacking continuations. He played rook h2 kind of. You notice in this position, even though Nakamura is a great attacking player, he also shows some patience in this game. Yeah, I thought that... Uh, Bishop h6 here was interesting because notice that if he plays rook to e8 here, what can white do? So I think this move was kind of tempting. We, well, I mean, we could always look at these crazy sacrifices because our position is, is so strong, but there's a move here that's just much more direct than that. that worked in really good tandem with bishop h6, sticking that rook on e. Because when we play bishop h6, the only move to, to um, protect the rook is rook e8, right? G5. Yeah, so g5 here looks quite strong because before the knight could have retreated back to e8, and now it must go to h5 where we could just take it, right? So that was another option um, for Nakamura. But honestly, his position is very good now as well. So he's going for like the kind of slow attack here. And now we see the, the bishop coming backwards, and he's going to get his pawn storm going. He decided to play g5 right away. He could also probably play h5 right away. They both look really strong. A lot of, that's why the knight's so good on g3, because those of you who play the dragon are probably familiar with situations where the knight can blockade on h5, and it's kind of hard to continue the attack. Whereas here, look how beautifully this knight stops that, right? So the knight on g3, even though it didn't get to go to f5, ended up becoming a really important piece here. So the knight goes back to e8. And now Nakamura, of course, follows it up with h5. He's trying to yank that file open. Nakamura, I mean, sorry, Carlson getting some counterplay on b2. But you see, like, his counterplay just seems a lot more awkward. We call, um, when uh, Benefer does a commentary here at the St. Louis Chess Club, we call this a uh, rook up and over, that we saw say it's a rover. Um, and a lot of times it's really an effective way to get your rooks in the game without cranking the file open with a pawn. But here it just does seem like, just visually, look at white's attack and look at black's attack, right? It just doesn't feel like black has enough going on, right? And also white can just stop this attack with what move? What can white play here to prevent rook takes b2 check? Just simple, 
just a simple move. Yeah, bishop c1. And that was also one of the reasons earlier that we might not have traded that. And also a reason why having the, uh, the king on b1 is nice, because if it was on c1, we wouldn't have bishop c1. So bishop c1 protecting this pawn very well. Challenging uh, Swaran to come up with uh, some, uh, better, some better ideas here as black, some better counterattacking ideas. So rook b3 hitting our queen, queen g4. Now knight b6 getting one more piece in. Now question, why would it, what do you think, I mean, in, in all these types of attacking positions, you always want to look at all the forcing variations. So, you know, at this point you're looking at stuff like, H takes G6 right away, right? Trying to see if that works out or not. And one of the biggest mistakes that players make when they get an attack like this is they rush it then once they build it all up. And that's why it's good to study games of great players like Nakamura. So you see like how even though he's a slashing attacking player, he really takes his time to make sure that the attack's gonna be successful. Because let's say you do play H takes G6 right away. Well, it's gonna work out really well if your opponent happens to play H takes G6, right? Because then, you just get to go where? Just play queen h4 and it's like over, oh, resigns, right? Whereas, because we're threatening queen h8 and queen h7 mate, and if you, you move your f pawn, we're just going to play queen h8 and rook h7, also mating. So instead, of course, black would take with what here? We would take with the f pawn, right? And now it's like not so clear you've. Uh, gained in this position, right? Because queen e6 check, um, black seems to be holding on by a thread when they play queen f7. In general, in chess, there's a lot of talk about how important it is to bring the queen into the attack, which is very true. If you trade queens in chess, a lot of times your attacking chances plummet or disappear often. But there's not as much attention paid to the fact that getting the queen into the defense is equally important, right? If you can get the queen into the defense, often that really just like stops white's attack in its tracks. So um, Nakamura is not going to rush with that. Instead, he's going to take it slow and try to get another piece into the attack. By playing bishop e2, which piece is he going to get into the attack? Not the bishop, but the rook on d1, right? So very nice play by Nakamura so far. And uh, seems like he just really, from the opening, he's gotten like a great position and he's managed to nurse it pretty well, right? So now we got rook to dh1, getting that extra piece in. And now uh, Carlson uh, tried to make things really complicated by playing bishop takes b2 because it just looks like he's going to get uh, butchered if he doesn't, right? I mean, if he doesn't try something here, just that the threats seem very overwhelming. These two major pieces lined up. And now h takes g6 is certainly coming because if you take back, now we have the, uh, the rooks coming to, to get you as well, right? So that's not going to work out. So well, we even have like some pretty possibilities like... We just make like some random terrible move by black. Um, we can uh, think about doing things like, well, that would be really terrible. <laughs> I'm trying to make the I'm trying to make this a uh, two rook checkmate. I don't know if that's going to quite work, <laughs> but um, queen e six check looks good. I mean, we're just winning. We can even just win the knight. So, um, and rook h seven stuff is coming up as well. So. Carlson felt like it was the moment to try whatever he could, right? Desper Desperado, if you will. Bishop takes b2. Bishop takes b2. And now knight takes c4, right? But notice that Nakamura's rook here in h2 is also performing this defensive function as well as an attacking function. It's very important. And now we, we see uh, this position, which, uh, so he can't, he can't take back with, the, with, the pawn, with either pawn, both of them. Seems like it's just going to be devastating for black. Um, we could take a quick look at that, but he just decided to play queen b6, getting counterplay. And now, what do you think uh, Nakamura did? There was actually a nice uh, article about this on Chess Life Online by the really great Australian writer, um, Ian Rogers, where he made this whole game into a musical. Actually, there was just a jazz concert over across the street at the World Jazz Hall of Fame. And I think when Nakamura played this move, he said, uh, I think I might win this time. Is there, is there a song like that? I might finally win. <laughs> <laughs> I can't remember what the song was. But it was very applicable to this position. And there was like 30 or 40 songs that he tried to kind of like explain this game just because there was so much drama in it.
No, um, well, let's we'll take a look at GF7. So GF7, Rook takes F7 also seems like definitely a possibility here. And if Queen C8 check. Yeah, I think we can. So we've got stuff going on over here. So now we can go here. Yeah, so I think if you're going to go for this line, get one more piece into the attack. <coughs> and we're still covering, um, seems like we're still covering um, here after, after Rook takes B2 check. We're still covering this uh, rank here, so you don't have any like quick checkmates on us. And meanwhile, we're going to bring our knight to f6 and queen to c8 in conjunction and try to mate you on h7. So this would be a possibility, too. So I guess what this shows is that Nakamura just has lots of nice possibilities here. So instead, g7. And yeah, so g7 is kind of an important move. Just king can't take. Because if the king takes, we just take back on h7 check, and we're going to win your queen or mate. So instead, black had to move his rook away. And now black has to, white has to be a little bit careful. Like, what happens if he plays rook takes h7 here? Okay, so rook takes b2, and now if king a1, somebody, what's that? Yeah, so rook to a2 check, and then queen b2 mate. So very double-edged, so it looks like, you know, Carlson has gotten something, and that he has some, like, threats that are lying there in the position. And of course, Nakamura is not going to miss that, and that's why his uh, rook is, like, chilling on h2 to stop all that kind of stuff. So instead, Nakamura played queen to h4, to attack a checkmate directly, right? And continue to keep the defense of this bishop here on b2. Jim, hmm? real quick, instead of g7, if he'd go g takes h check? Right, okay, so we looked at g takes f7 check, which seemed promising as well. And then in the game, g7 check happened. And then Ken in the audience is asking about g takes h7 check, a good question. Because if we play uh, king g7, that looks uh, pretty terrible, right? So probably we'll play king h8 here. And now it looks like we're, we're being actually helped by the fact that that pawn's there, yeah. right? Because it's shielding us from the attack, which is an interesting defensive uh, you know, kind of motif in chess that sometimes when your opponent's attack is crashing through, you can actually stop it by letting them take your pawns. A very typical thing that happens in the dragon as well. You see that all the time. So instead we were here in this position and Nakamura played queen h4 threatening checkmate and continuing to defend this against these mating threats on b2. So after rook b2, king, b1, king a1, of course none of this rook a2 stuff works anymore because we're continuing to cover the rank. So instead, um, Carlson uh, traded on h2 and now he has to defend against g6, right? So he played queen g6. So this is obviously... Um, you know, bad news, now his attack has led to nothing and he's using his queen as a defender, which I did just say was good. It's good if you get your queen into the defense, but in this situation, the queen is very awkwardly placed. It doesn't really have a lot of spaces to move to, right? Um, especially after Nakamura's next move. So yes, it's good to get the queen into the defense if it works, <laughs> right? Like that's, uh, I'm sure that'll be useful. It's, it's anything that I, any, any like maxim that you say in chess, like it's good to uh, centralize if it works. It's good, to <laughs> it's good to get your queen in the, in the defense. Just make sure that it's good. But um, seriously, yeah, this is uh, definitely an exception there that uh, Carlson was forced to do this, but it doesn't work out so well for him. So how do you think white plays here? Yeah, we've been kind of like wanting to play knight to f5 for a long time. And now finally we get it. And um, to boot, we're threatening a knight e7 check, um, just, just forking the king and the queen. So Magnus had to play rook to e8 to prevent that. So he seems like he's totally on the defensive. That being said, working in his favor is the fact that Nakamura has very few pieces left in the board, right? We're working with just the queen, the knight, and the rook. So we have to be really precise to like close the deal here, right? And after queen to g4, what do you think white's idea is here? What's white's idea here? Ooh. What's that? Yeah? Rook Nikki? 
Yeah, just rook to h6, and that and that's what I was saying about the queen in the defense. That like this queen, the defensive position does not look as attractive as many because um, if we play like a dummy move here for black, rook to h6 will just simply uh, trap the queen, right? So um, Carlson had to move his queen again, and now this is where things started to fall apart a little bit for Nakamura. So. He played queen to h3. Queen went back to g6. Obviously, he didn't want to draw here. So they've re repeated this position once. Or I'm sorry, they didn't really, because it, it was on h4 before, right? Yeah, yeah, that, sorry. They, they, yeah, it looks similar, but it's not exactly the same. So now, um, this is where, where uh, Nakamura made a blunder. How bad do you think the blunder was, Ben? Because I feel like a lot of people online were saying it was like one of the most grotesque blunders they'd ever seen. But that, of course, they're using their engines to, to support that. And so to me, it seems like, OK, obviously, at that high of a level, it's a big blunder. But I think it's like it's not as obvious as people were making it out to be. Would you agree with that? Yeah, the, game, the games on the internet between super GMs are always a lot more complicated than the people at home with their computers are saying. Yeah, because I was I saw this move and people were like amazing blunder and I like when I think amazing blunder I think like cram that Kangy and maiden one yeah, to right. deep Fritz or something, you know, or like there are like a lot of or Gary Kasparov against Deep Blue. I just used two uh computer examples, but there are definitely some blunders that super GMs make and I just don't think that this ranks in the um top ones because it's like a little bit difficult to see. Yeah, there was some crazy computer win here with like Queen F one and Rick takes H seven. Yes, there's a beautiful, well, although Queen F1 is good even if you don't see the computer right, win. Because yeah. Queen, Queen F1 is just a really, really sweet move here. I, I don't know, it's just like such a cool looking move because you're moving your queen backwards, which usually seems like the opposite of what you would want to do to attack. But the nice thing is you have all these extra threats now because you're coming in again possibly with Rook H6 at the right moment and you're also attacking this. And F7 is going to be under fire if you play Knight to H6, right? He tries to move his queen away, so that this this was like the, this was like the star move here. And then, for instance, if Carlson were just to play b5, White here had a spectacular way to finish. Although I think that even if you didn't find the spectacular way, there are also just like prosaic moves that do pretty well here as well. But so yeah, this this crazy move, rook takes h7, which Ben mentioned. So what's the idea? Let's uh, let's let's uh, go through. Let's try to calculate it to the end. So somebody try to do some analysis for me of why this is kaput. Right. So if king takes h7, just queen h1, king g8, queen h8 mate. Right. So what happens if uh, queen takes h7? What's the full line there? Queen h7, knight h6. So knight h6, king takes g7. Yeah. So you got to try to analyze it. So try to analyze it to the end. So where where are we at now? We're at queen takes h7. So this is the anal anal analysis and knight to, knight to h6 check here. So now if king g7. So queen takes f7 check, and then we have to go king to h8, and then king g7. So now you're close to mate. Queen f7 check, king h8, and then queen f8, right? So, yeah, so instead of, it's just over, right? So a very cool line, but um, regardless, uh, Nakamura in, in this position played d6, which is a really bad move, but you kind of feel sorry for him because it's like very understandable why somebody would play that move. To me, I mean, it looks like really, I don't know, it looks really strong on first glance because your idea is that if they take twice on d6, you play queen h7 mate, right? But what the problem here is, which is, I think, difficult for a lot of humans to see, is that black, in the meantime, has gotten so many pawns, and white's king is relatively weak, that white really needed to find the hammer blow and keep complete control over the position, right? Like I said earlier that that pawn on d5 kept con total control because black wasn't getting any counterplay because the files are all closed. In order to get the desperate bid for counterplay that he got, which got him back into the game, he had to pull up a rover, rook up and over, because there were no lines open to him, right? So this is kind of changing the story. And black just makes this very elegant move here. 
instead of taking on d6, getting checkmate in, he just plays rook to d8, and now suddenly, you see, like, if Nakamura is not mating us, suddenly, um, you're, you've got, we've already got six pawns to four. It looks like this one's going to hang, and this one might hang. And your king now is under fire. So... Yeah, when he played d6, Carlson had a look on his face like, well, I guess at that level, I'm sure it's a blunder. Yeah. I just thought it was exaggerated this, this from the. Um, this is close to winning still for Roy. He has to play knight c8 here if he's going to find it. Well, yeah, yeah, knight c8 here would be like the closest to. Uh, would be, would be the, the try, and then white's a little bit better, right? Is winning? White, white's be better, yeah. Yeah, better. Yeah. So. Um, knight c8, obviously that's a weird move, <laughs> but again, that's supposedly the best move. Knight c4 instead was played like the more like normal looking move, but the problem is the knight gets kicked around now after queen takes pawn, and actually um, Nakamura ended up losing this game, which is like really, uh, obviously was very emotionally difficult because he seemed to have such a dominant position, and it just shows like how something can just like slip from your grasp against such a great player. The thing is, weaker players than Carlsen would just completely collapse like many moves ago, you know? And that's the thing, like some people say that Carlsen's style is like a little bit hard to define, that it's just about making good moves. And I do think like his fighting spirit is one thing you can pinpoint because a lot of the time he uh, doesn't get much from the opening and he still, you know, you saw at the Singfield Cup his amazing fighting spirit. So Rook D3 now hitting uh, C4 again and he ends up, uh, after queen f5, he ends up picking up another pawn. Yeah, because of the attack on the rook on h4. And now he just uh, ended up winning this game. I mean, this is a, a, an, an awful lot of pawns to defend against, right? For just having the one knight. And so, sad. So I think we're gonna just like go over this really quickly and so I can, so I can at least show you the beginning of the Anon game as a counterpoint for a game where Nakamura won and instead of losing in uh, such such tragic fashion because he is a St. Louis player and he uh, calls St. Louis his home. So this is how the game ended. Yeah. And with another queen coming for Magnus. Wow. So how many people had seen that game before? It was kind of famous. I mean, it only occurred a, a month ago. What, February? I think early February. So it's been about two months. So. So in this game, which we're not going to get a chance to look at all of, but uh, I'll show you the opening and the um, critical moment at the end, uh, Nakamura uh, was playing black this time against Vichyanon, who he's done rather well against, indeed. So the complete opposite. Uh, he's had a terrible score against Carlsen, and he's managed to do well against Anon. So you imagine there's some psychological element to that, right? There's a lot of psychology in chess. Um, not as much as there is in poker, but it's, it's, it's definitely underrated. I think especially at the top level where you play the same people all the time, so you get this kind of like thing about your score and your openings, and probably the biggest psychological element in chess is before the game in selecting the openings and that like, whole surprise element. So in this game, what interested me, it was there was a quote here by Nakamura that Objectively, I shouldn't even cast along, but I felt it was very interesting. I have a feeling it was suspicious, to say the least. So that's one of the reasons why, even though Nakamura, you know, has like a lot of uh, ups and downs, and uh, sometimes says says like funny things, um, <laughs> funny things uh, to say to put it in the most politically correct way. Um, he, you got to love him because he's in the top five players in the world most of the time, and he says that he played this move even though he thought it was bad. Just because he thought it would make the game more interesting. I mean, that's kind of rare at that. It's ex extremely rare at that level, especially because he's not doing it against a lower-rated player, um, where he, you know, feels like he needs to win. He's doing it against uh, one of the best players ever. Right? That's that's very very awesome for the fans, at least. <laughs> so he queenside castled here, and again, I mentioned earlier that queenside castling leads to such sharp positions where both sides are attacking. So we see that again in this game, that both sides are going to end up attacking in their respective flanks. Here, Anon playing a4. How many people prefer white's position here? How many people um, are undecided? <laughs> How many people like black after my speech? <laughs> oh, <laughs> hey, Ben likes both flanks. Seems like a square. 
Black seems like a square. It's a square of pawns. Oh yeah, yeah, that is kind of unusual. Like this, like doubled pawn phalanx here, right here against the king, where the king position. So, so f6 is we see these kinds of moves a lot in these opposite side castling moves. Normally, we don't see the f pawn move too often when we're castled king side, but here we are trying to play g5 at some point. So now Nakamura just decided to go for it and make this uh, this wild sacrifice because he thought his position was like pretty bad if he didn't go for something like that. And now, how do you think white plays here? Ben! Watching the games live helps. <laughs> Did you watch all the major li moves live? Yeah. Mm -hmm. Well, queen g4 check and queen g2 mate is annoying, and so is rook takes queen. I hate when that happens. <laughs> I'm going to guess 94. Exactly, we have. 92 is a move also. I think 92 was played, actually, yeah. yeah. I'm sure which is better. They were arguing about it. What did you think of the game when it was being played? I thought this was quite good for White, and then about 10 moves later, I didn't think it was quite good for White. Yeah. I think, he, I think he made a couple mistakes. I think it probably is better for White here. Is it hard for you when you have, um, like, an American playing against one of your old friends you don't know who to root for? Uh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it's hard. It's a very politically correct response. We know Ben's rooting for someone, but he's not telling us who it is. Because he doesn't want it to be broadcast to YouTube to our, what, like 12,000 subscribers or something? And growing. So yeah, I mean, this is a, good, a pretty complicated position to evaluate because um, White, White's got the two minor pieces versus the Rook. And in general, in attacking positions, we way prefer to have the minor pieces. But at the same time, black's, white's king is a bit open. Um, how many people would prefer to be white at this point? Yeah, you you know, so you'd prefer to be black here, despite everything. Yeah, I feel like black. I feel like black is probably. I think at the um, non master level, probably black's doing pretty well here, because the king is so exposed. What's that? Nakamura's really good at positions that are confusing. Yeah, Nakamura. Um, confused like we are. Ben says that Nakamura is really good at confusing positions. Yeah, he he does like that. Although he he also knows how to play like a, a solid position as well. But he's you see more and more that sometimes he just plays like a pretty solid opening. So yeah, again, remember Ken earlier? You were talking about a position where you want you're trying to play a six and yank open the file. So sometimes the opponent can use their pawns to uh, stop it from being super ugly, right? So now after b6, if a nine were to continue with a7, we could shield our king, using our king to shield from further attack, right? So let's get to the end of this game and see how Nakamura um, won brilliantly so we can have a little bit of fun. We did a rover, rook b6, f5. Exactly, we got the rover in this game too. So basically, Black is doing well in this game now, and Black did well in the last game with a rover, so there you go. Rook up and over, a way to get your rooks into the attack. So taking you an f5, preventing it. Now after queen takes f5, we're renewing the idea, although I mean knight g3 is possible, but we're going to be able to continue to attack with h5 and h4, right? Knight g3, queen d7. And so now he's using that king, getting it out of the way. And so h5 is just you know a kind of move that you're always playing when your opponent has their knight on g3, right? <laughs> try to try to get it out of the way. So of course you know now in this position, I mean one thing I always try, try to tell people is about queen trades. When your opponent offers you a trade of queens, really the first thing you want to ask yourself is about king safety. So if you your king is safer than your opponent's, you really want to lean against trading queens, right? Because that usually takes all the fun out of attack. And that's actually a contrasting principle to the principle that rooks are usually good and better at end games than in mill games. So I think here Nakamura is, is strongly more in favor of the other principle, considering that he's coming in with this and with this possibility, and this king is here naked. So I really like the finish in this game, so I'm going to head over to that. As you can see, um, yeah, so yeah, tell me about, man, I didn't want to go there that far. Okay, so let's talk about this position. T t tell me why rook takes e3 is a good move. So if rook takes e3, if queen takes e3, of course there's just 
meter one, right? So what happens if pawn takes e3? So try to analyze to the end of the game after, after f takes e3. So rook takes e3, we always look at all the captures, pretty clear, queen takes e3, it's, it's a checkmate in one on g2. So after f takes e3, what is the variation that uh, Nakamura had in mind and actually ended up playing? Um, who said that? Yeah. So queen d2, and then how would uh, white defend? Queen f1 or queen f3, and then what would black play? Well, if, if queen f3, rook d3 is certainly a good possibility. But in the game, actually, white did play queen to f1. So I think after a queen f3, rook g3 is probably pretty good, yeah? With the idea that this knight is pinned so it can't take, right? And the queen, of course, can't take. So if the queen goes back, black can just play rook takes e3, and everything is, is, is pretty lovely there. So instead, though, white played queen to f1. Yeah, he did play rook f6, and actually just a, a non-immediate really resigned. So it just looks like uh, totally over here. Because everything is, everything is falling apart. e3 is falling, b2 is falling, and we're coming in with our queen and our rook here. So, so um, two examples of Nakamura games, one where his explosive attack kind of like backfired on him, and after just like one pretty big blunder, and another one in which he um, played uh, something which he actually said he thought was bad, just in order to get an exciting position. Mm -hmm.